Good evening. As Provost of Duke University, it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture with Ambassador Nikki Haley. The Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture Series is sponsored by the Sanford School of Public Policy with support from the William R. Keenan Charitable Trust. This lecture series honors Terry Sanford, the founder of the Sanford School, who dedicated his life to ethical leadership and public life. Sanford was governor of North Carolina in the early 1960s, president of Duke for 15 years, and a US senator. Last August, he would have turned 100 years old. We have been celebrating his legacy with a series of centennial events throughout the academic year. In keeping with the spirit of Terry Sanford, the purpose of this distinguished lecture is to bring campus men and women of the highest personal and professional stature to present to the Duke community. Tonight's event with Ambassador Haley is co-sponsored by the Duke Program in American Grand Strategy, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary. The Program in American Grand Strategy seeks to prepare the next generation of strategists by studying past generations and interacting with current strategic leaders. Tonight's lecture is part of that vitally important dialogue. Ambassador Haley is the 29th US Permanent Representative to the United Nations and is also a member of the President's Cabinet and National Security Council. The, Uni the United Nations is at the center of many of the most contentious and critical foreign policy challenges the Trump administration must confront. And tonight's distinguished guest has played one of the leading roles in advancing American interests and forging cooperative relations with like-minded partners in the current environment. Prior to serving in the current administration, Ambassador Haley was a path-breaking Southern governor, not unlike Terry Sanford. She was elected in 2010 as the first female and first minority governor of South Carolina, and she was re-elected in 2014. In 2016, Haley was named among the 100 most influential people by Time Magazine. This evening, she will give some prepared remarks, and then Peter Fever, director of the American Grand Strategy Program and professor of political science and public policy, will join for an extended conversation about the issues of the day. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Haley. Thank you. Wow, that is very, very kind. I want to thank Dr. Kornbluth. I want to thank President Price for hosting me here on campus. It's so good to be in my sister state. Uh, you know, I can tell you it's a real pleasure to be here at Duke. It's absolutely beautiful. Some of you might know that I'm a Clemson girl. Yes, <laughs> so coming here to Duke, we've enjoyed our relationship on the football field. <laughs> Not so much on the basketball court. I do have to tell you, I saw um, NBA Commissioner Silver just a couple of days ago, and he said, when you go, make sure you tell him I'm a Dukey. And he said, and tell them I send my regards. So um, job accomplished. You know, people sometimes ask me the biggest difference between being governor of South Carolina and being the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Well, there's the little stuff. The pace is different in New York. It's a city that truly never sleeps. The people are different. Everyone talks very fast, even faster than me. And the weather is way worse. But the biggest difference by far between governor and being ambassador is the nature of the opposition. In South Carolina, I had political battles with other officials who I disagreed with. Some were in the other party, some were in my own party. We had real differences about what was best for our state and her people, mostly on taxes, spending, and the role of government. But at the United Nations, I'm butting heads on a near daily basis 
with people who represent actual tyrants, governments that imprison, torture, and even kill innocent people. I sit across the negotiating table from representatives of regimes that commit genocide, governments that starve their own people to fund illegal weapons programs, and dictators who use the torture of children as a political weapon. This is an important distinction for all of us to keep in mind. Real leadership is bringing people around to your point of view by showing them how it is in their best interests to do so. But we're losing this skill today, especially in our politics, on our campuses, and in the media. We're focused on our differences rather than what brings us together. And we're increasingly prone to view those who disagree with us, not just as wrong, but as evil. Instead of trying to understand our political opponents, we too often write them off as not even fit to have a conversation with. In the last year, working in depth in foreign relations, I have seen true evil, and it's not in the American political system. In South Sudan, where rape is routinely used as a weapon of war, that is evil. In Syria, where the dictator uses chemical weapons to murder innocent children, that is evil. In North Korea, where the depraved regime forces its own citizens into slave labor and tortures American student Otto Warmbier to death, that is evil. But American politics is not the international arena. For those of you who are interested in American politics and thinking about a career in public service in our country, I urge you to remember that your political opponents are not your enemies, and they are not evil. They're just your opponents. Take it from me, there's a big difference. It's this challenge that I want to talk about today. How can we defend America in the international arena in a world with some truly bad actors without losing our sense of who we are and what we believe. The first thing to know is that there is no avoiding dealing with unsavory regimes. The UN Security Council is not a big place. There are just 15 of us. There are five permanent members, China, Russia, France, the UK, and the US and there are 10 members who are elected by the General Assembly to serve a rotating two-year term. Some governments that truly stifle free speech, imprison their political rivals, and terrorize their own people can and do get elected to the Security Council. Some serve permanently. It's this fact that presents a fundamental challenge for the United States at the United Nations. All nations come together to supposedly protect peace and security around the world. But not all nations are the same. Democracies like ours represent our people and our values. I am accountable to the American people. But too many governments represented at the UN are not accountable to their people. They don't respect the freedom and human dignity of their people, so of course, they don't respect others. They are answerable to no one. They can and do trade in lies and falsehoods. In this way, the international arena is fundamentally different from our domestic politics. Here at home, consensus is sometimes possible. And when it's not, compromises can be made. If we can't reach consensus and we don't want to compromise, there's always the next election to sort out our differences, peacefully. But internationally, a country like the United States is rarely going to find common ground with the world's worst regimes. Nor should we. So the question becomes, how do we defend the interests and the values of the United States among countries that are systematically hostile to those interests and values? A good example of this challenge that we face occurred a few weeks ago when one permanent member of the Security Council, Russia, was credibly accused of using a chemical weapon in an attempted murder 
on the territory of another permanent member, a member that happens to be one of our closest allies, Great Britain. Russia used a terrifying nerve agent to attempt to assassinate a former Russian agent who was living in Britain and his daughter. This was a military grade nerve agent and it was used in a public space. Dozens of civilians and first responders were also exposed. It was a serious international incident, an attack on a great friend of the United States with the sort of chemical weapon that has not been used in Europe since World War II. So how should we respond? History tells us that when the United States fails to lead and fails to stand up for our friends and our values, we suffer and the world suffers. We've seen this in recent years, painfully. For six years, the Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad had bombed, starved, and gassed his own people with chemical weapons. The U.S. had drawn a red line in Syria a few years ago that it refused to enforce. Instead, we stood aside as Russia entered the conflict and became Assad's partner in killing Syrians and their protector in the international arena. And we stood aside as the genocidal terrorist group, ISIS, took over more than a third of the territory in Syria and Iraq. The United States also stood and watched in 2014 while Russia attempted to forcibly redraw Europe's borders for the first time since World War II. Russia invaded Ukraine, swallowed Crimea, and continues to push its way into eastern Ukraine. Those were failures of American leadership. So when Russia used a chemical weapon on the territory of our ally, we made the decision to lead. We confronted the Russian ambassador with the facts in the UN Security Council. We told him the United States knew full well that Russia was behind the poisoning. We assured him we were standing in absolute solidarity with the British in defending their right to respond to foreign attacks on their soil. We did this not just to defend our friend, but to protect American citizens. Unless someone pushes back, who's to say Russia doesn't do this again? But next time, maybe it'll be in New York, or Washington, D.C., or Durham, North Carolina. In response, the Russians did what they always do. They denied it. They have even laughably suggested that the British themselves are behind the attack. This incident is far from over, but the United States' decision to lead has already accomplished something very important. We've challenged Russia's lies. We've defended our friend and ally's right to control its own territory. And now other countries are following suit. After we expelled 60 Russian intelligence officers hiding undercover as diplomats, countries like Canada, France, Germany, Australia, and Italy also expelled Russian intelligence officers. In total, 29 countries plus NATO sent home 153 Russian intelligence officers. United States leadership doesn't have to involve military action. Our most effective leadership is, in fact, when we lead by example, when we embrace the fact that we are a special nation with a special message to the world. Each of us, every single one of us, has God-given rights that cannot legitimately be denied. This test of American leadership arises at the United Nations quite often. The previous administration chose to ease sanctions on the Castro regime in Cuba without demanding respect for the human rights of the Cuban people in return. We broke faith with the Cubans who died trying to reach our shores and the Cubans who were left behind in their island prison. Our action benefited no one but the Cuban dictatorship and our most deeply held values were undermined. 
we have reversed that decision. Over many years, too often, we have not met the test of standing up for our values at the United Nations. This is not because previous ambassadors and administrations didn't believe in freedom, democracy, and human rights. It's because it's often just easier not to rock the boat. When the crowd is all going one way, it's sometimes hard to be the only one going in the other direction. But in America, we don't celebrate the mob. We celebrate the person who has the courage and conviction to stand up to the mob. For example, the United Nations spends a wildly disproportionate amount of time singling out Israel for criticism. The amount and the tenor of its anti-Israel bias is shocking. The Security Council has a monthly meeting on the Middle East that is devoted solely to, bash to bashing Israel. The Human Rights Council has an agenda item devoted only to Israel. Of all the atrocities that occur every day in places like Syria, Yemen, Burma, Iran, and North Korea, the Human Rights Council singles out Israel? Soon after coming to the UN last year, we decided we weren't going to silently accept this anymore. Israel is our great friend and a <laughs> and Israel is a lonely voice for democracy and human dignity in the Middle East. So we've begun to use the monthly Middle East meeting to talk about the real sources of conflict in the region. Iran, Assad, ISIS, Hezbollah, Hamas. And we've made it clear to the Human Rights Council that either it will change or it will pursue its biased agenda without the United States as a member. We've made these changes to have the back of our friend and ally Israel, absolutely. But we're also sending the message that the era of the United States leaving, leading from behind is over. I like to say that it's a new day at the UN. What I mean is that it's a new day for the United States in the world. We will not hesitate to protect our interests, defend our allies, and stand up for our values. We have, for example, entered a new era of leadership in our relationship with Iran. The Iran nuclear deal was designed to be too big to fail. For years, not just the United States, but our allies in Europe have overlooked Iranian ballistic missile launches, support for terrorists, and the oppression of the Iranian people in order to preserve the nuclear deal. The deal's architects claimed that our choices were either accept a bad deal or go to war with Iran. This administration has had the courage to challenge this false choice. We are working with our European allies to strengthen the agreement and hold the Iranian regime to account for its support of regional terrorism. The President has set a deadline of mid-May to determine our continued participation in the deal. But whether we stay in the nuclear deal or not, strengthening our approach to holding Iran accountable for its actions sends a powerful message to Iran. And to another hostile country, North Korea. Those who argue that the United States leaving or altering the Iran deal would send the message to North Korea that we cannot be trusted to live up to our agreements have it completely wrong. Insisting on more inspections, no sunset clauses, and an end to Iran's ballistic missile program tells the North Korean regime that we mean business that we won't accept a bad agreement just so we can declare a hollow victory that fails to enhance our security. At the United Nations and elsewhere, the United States has led a campaign of maximum economic and diplomatic pressure on North Korea. That campaign has produced results. The North Korean leadership has signaled that it wants to talk. What we do with the Iranian regime will have an impact on the talks we have with North Korea. Showing strong leadership with Tehran 
will produce better results with Pyongyang. We're also showing new leadership at the UN by reviewing our foreign assistance to those countries that consistently oppose our policies and our values. Much of our assistance is humanitarian, which is fully consistent with who we are as a country. That assistance will absolutely continue. But it's simply common sense that we provide other forms of aid to countries that support us at the UN and outside of the UN and deny additional money to those who don't. Sometimes the positions of leadership we take leave us publicly isolated at the UN. When we stand up for our sovereign right to decide where we put our embassies or when we speak out against the Castro regime's inhumane treatment of the Cuban people, we usually don't have a lot of countries voting with us. When that happens, some observers portray America as being isolated, as if that's automatically a bad thing. But standing alone on behalf of America's interests is not something to be embarrassed by. Being the lone voice for freedom and human dignity is something to be proud of. When those lopsided votes against the U.S. position come in, I remind myself of the people and the things that have received loud expressions of public support at the UN in the past, like the cheers that greeted the Venezuelan dictator, Hugo Chavez, in the General Assembly in 2006, or the applause that erupted when the UN passed the anti-Semitic resolution equating Zionism with racism in 1974. If all it takes is cheap anti-American or anti-Israeli rants to win the applause of the United Nations, then we're happy to do without it. If the United States has to sit on the sidelines and apologize for our values in order to be loved at the United Nations, then we're better off without such approval. When I speak in the UN Security Council, other than my immediate fellow ambassadors, I have two very different audiences in mind. First and foremost, I'm speaking for the American people who deserve a return on their investment in the United Nations, and they deserve to have their interests protected and promoted. But the UN also has a worldwide audience. My position, therefore, makes me an international voice for American values. I'm speaking to people all over the world who are suffering under tyranny imposed by their own governments. My great predecessor at the United Nations, Jean Kirkpatrick, understood this very well. She was an assertive and unapologetic defender of freedom and human rights during the height of the Cold War. She wasn't the most popular ambassador in the Security Council, but after she left, when the spirit of reform started taking hold in the former Soviet Union, she finally saw the results of her strong and often lonely advocacy for American values. At a reception in Moscow, Ambassador Kirkpatrick was approached by the great Soviet dissident, Andrei Sakharov. He grabbed her hands and with great emotion told her that her message had penetrated even in the Soviet political prison system. He told her, quote, your name is known in every cell of the Gulag. I never knew Jean Kirkpatrick but I'm proud to carry on her mission at the United Nations today. Some of our opponents have changed. Some have stayed the same. But the power of the American example endures. Our commitment to freedom and human dignity, which has made the United States the most generous and powerful nation on the face of the earth, still has the power to inspire hearts and unnerve dictators. It is our most powerful tool in international relations. We must use it carefully, but we must never fail to lead with it. And we must never forget that we are a great nation, not because of who we are, but because of what we believe. The proof is in the people suffering in prisons and hiding places all over the world. America carries the hope of freedom 
that's in our hearts, the hope that sustains them, that the daughter of Indian immigrants now has the privilege to give voice to this message at the United Nations is a testament to the power of this hope. And as long as I am ambassador to the United Nations, America will never stop being a loud and proud messenger of hope in the world. Thank you and God bless. Thank you for that. We have a little bit of time to continue the conversation. Yes. And I, as you can tell, you have some friends in North Carolina as well as in South Carolina. And I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So I want to take up where you left off, which was in a, your vigorous defense of American ideals. And as you know, many observers of the administration have singled you out for praise because you have been such a clear and consistent voice on that issue. And at the, the, at the same time, they've criticized the rest of the administration for not speaking out as much on that, or at least not appearing to speak out so clearly and consistently, cozying maybe to dictators or, or quasi-authoritarian regimes. So my question for you is, do you think the administration has a clear message along the lines of what you outlined and could that message be uh, strengthened in some way? No, we absolutely have a clear message. I mean, our goal is to always protect our values here in America and spread that across the world. What I can tell you is different people have different ways of communicating. The administration is completely supportive of everything that I say because they don't tell me to stop. Now, if some of them say it a little bit differently or they say it and maybe don't have as much passion with it, that's just the personality. That doesn't mean they don't believe in it. And I think that's what everyone needs to understand is when I speak, I speak for the United States, I speak for the American people, and the administration supports what I say. So some interpreted the, uh, the Secretary Tillerson leaving as a vote of you know, no confidence in, in how he was managing the larger diplomatic message. And I'm mean, hearing from you that that's the wrong way to interpret that, or? I think he communicated differently. I think that you know, obviously management styles are different, personality styles are different, but never was it that, that Rex was against human rights or against sharing those values. I mean, he was very much for it. He just communicated differently than I do. Okay. Let me ask you another question that you might say sounds like a gotcha question. On Russia, just two days ago, um, H.R. McMaster said, we still haven't done enough to hold Putin accountable for all the things that he's done the, to include. You mentioned the, the uh, awful poisoning of the, the British uh, citizen, but also the interference in the 2016 elections. And across the line, Russia has directly challenged the United States, and, and McMaster said, uh, we haven't done enough yet to hold him accountable. So do you agree that we haven't done enough yet? What more could we do? I do think we haven't done enough yet, but I do know we're also doing that. I think if you look at the situation, um, you know, there's a political debate that has happened in this country on whether, we were, whether Russia is our friend or whether they're not our friend. That's, that's really the wrong question to have because Russia's never gonna be our friend. But having said that, that doesn't mean we don't wanna work with them. But we work with them when we need to and we slap them when we need to. That's just the way it needs to be. So then take the administration. And what has the administration done? Everybody likes to listen to the words. I'm gonna tell you, look at the actions. We expelled 60 Russian diplomats slash spies. We have armed Ukraine so that they can defend themselves. We have basically hit Russia's main ally in Syria, Assad, when he used chemical weapons. We're doing two things that Russia never wanted us to do, expand our military and expand our energy policies. 
So this president has actually done more against Russia than any president since Reagan. But because the words aren't the same, people view that differently. I'm action-oriented, so yes, everybody's going to say it differently, but what have we done? And you haven't seen the end of what this administration is going to do to Russia. You will continue to see that play out, and we should. And where we can work together, we should. I sat down with the Russian ambassador, and, I, and we both agreed that we had to find some common ground. So we sat down at a lunch on Valentine's Day. Um, just imagine the U.S. and the Russian having lunch on Valentine's Day. So we sat down at lunch, and he said, Russia wants a better relationship with the U.S. And I said, well, the U.S. would like a better relationship with Russia. And I said, but tell me how we can make that happen. And he said, well, we shouldn't be so hostile to each other. And he even said in council, she yells at us too much. And my response in council was, quit giving me reasons to yell at you. So having said that, we did come up with some things we agree, of, we agree on. We agree on what's happening in Afghanistan and working together on that. And we agreed to work together on African countries and the issues that we're dealing with there. So we will do that because it's in our best interest to find some common ground. But it's also in our best interest to condemn them when they do something wrong. If they use a nerve agent on another territory, we absolutely have to call them out. And so if they do wrong things, we'll call them out. If they work with us, we'll praise them. So where does this kind of tit-for-tat uh, escalation lead? Are we walking ourselves back into a Cold War with Russia where we expel diplomats, then they re re expel in retaliation? Now we have to do something Again, because otherwise they're one up on us. They began the offense and then, so where does this end? Our relationship with Russia is dependent solely on Russia. If they decide to be a good actor and deal in the international community like regular countries, they will see more countries want to work with them. If they want to continue to do things that deal with chemical weapons, move into um, taking over Ukraine and doing things in other parts of the world that are causing chaos, meddling in elections, you're going to continue to see. Countries are going to shy away from them. They're going to move away because we don't want to be friends with someone we can't trust. And right now we have to, you know, there is no trust between the U.S. and Russia. So some interpreted, th this was a theme that Secretary Tillerson um, waxed eloquent on in his last public uh, address, his uh, press uh, conference or press availability after he was, was informed that he would be stepping down. Um, and some interpreted that as a sign that he had been muzzled before, he, and now that he, having, that he was going to leave, he was free to speak. Do you think that's a fair reading of that thing? It, you, you keep being tough on Russia no matter what. Does that mean your job's in jeopardy, or uh, how do you, do you see the problem I'm struggling with, right? There, that message isn't clear and consistent across the administration. I can honestly tell you no one is muzzled in this administration. Um, the president, <laughs> the president actually is, what I appreciate is he just lets us do our job. He doesn't get in the way, he lets us do our job. When we meet every week at the White House for National Security Council meetings, he listens to all sides. He's movable. He can change his decision. But at the end of the day, he is the president. He makes the final decision. But Rex was never muzzled. I've never been muzzled. No one on the National Security Council gets muddled. We all try and do the work that the president would like us to do. But he has never called me and said, Nikki, don't say that, ever. So let me ask you about a, a question that you were pressed on when you met with the students earlier today. Um, several of them pushed you on the decision to move the, Jerus the embassy uh, to Jerusalem. And uh, there's a couple lines of critique of that, as you know. One is the argument that there's real costs associated with it, and that's why previous administrations, even though they came in promising to do it, then when they looked at the actual costs, they said, costs are too high, not worth it. That's one line of critique. And the second line of critique is that 
if we're going to do that, let's make that part of a grand bargain that produces the Middle East peace. Otherwise, we're making a huge concession to our Israeli friends and getting nothing in return for it. And so it's bad negotiating is, is the second line of critique for it. And what's your answer to those two lines? So I can tell you one of the priorities of this administration is to work a peace plan between the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's very important to the administration, very important to the president, and we have go been going down that path. But the American public is the most important to the president. And for years, the American people, represented by Congress, have said they want Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel. Do you want me to stop? Are you turning this off? Okay. They have said that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, and they have said the embassy should be in the capital. It was voted on unanimously by Congress again, and the president said, why are we defying the American people? Now, the embassy side, whether it was the Israelis or the Palestinians, both talked about it, and the president didn't want that to be anything that was dangled out for either one. He wanted to do what the American people wanted first, not what the Israelis decided, not what the Palestinians decided, and he did what we do in almost every other country in the world, and he's moving the capital, he's moving the embassy in the capital of Israel. Now, he made it very clear, and we have said this to both the Israelis and the Palestinians, this does not define the borders of Jerusalem. The only ones that are going to define the borders of Jerusalem are the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's theirs to decide, not ours. And so when they do, we're going to support whatever they come up with. The peace plan that's going to be delivered is going to be put out there to be a conversation point. Neither the Israelis or the Palestinians will love it, and neither the Israelis or the Palestinians will hate it. That's what a compromise is. And so that's going to go forward. But putting our embassy in the capital, like we do in every other country, that was something that needed to happen, and it was what the American people asked for. And, you know, the president, yes, everybody, there were multiple people that came to him and said the sky was going to fall, like they told many presidents before. It's still up there. Did we pay a price, though? Uh, did you get locked out of the, uh, the coffee room in the UN Security Council uh, uh, quarters? I mean, surely there was some price that was paid for this. No, I think there was no price that was paid. I mean, first of all, I had no problem defending the American people or an American decision, and I never will. The second thing is they knew it's our sovereign right to decide where to put our embassy. It's not for Russia or China or Saudi Arabia to decide where we're going to put our embassy. It's for the American people to decide. Now, what they did try and do was humiliate us. They did try and embarrass us. They had a vote in the Security Council um, to attempt to condemn us, and I was the sole veto. It was the proudest vote I've ever taken. And then I can tell you they took us to the General Assembly with the resolution that didn't change anything. It was just solely there to embarrass the United States. And we stood there. We told them we had every right to do what we wanted to do. I thought we might get two or three votes. We actually had 69 countries that refused to condemn us, whether it was in their vote, whether it was in abstaining, and whether it was just not showing up, which we told them all three of those were welcome. Um, but you know, these, my job is not to get along and be liked at the United Nations. My goal is to be respected, but respected for defending my country in a way that I know that we're representing American values. You, I think at that time, said you're taking names. So what did that mean, you're taking names? What, what will that lead to? When I came into this position, it was very important for me to let them know that we were taking names because we had been taken for granted, we had been disrespected and treated terribly at the UN. And so what I wanted them to know was we were going to be taking names. We were going to take names of our friends. We were going to take names of those that criticized us. We're just going to be taking names. 
And that's what we've done. And I think you see now with the financial aid, humanitarian, we're always going to do. That's the, the heart of America. We'll never stop doing that. But on that additional money that we give, would we rather give it to countries that have mutual respect and mutual values, or would you rather give it to countries that say death to America and disrespect us? It's just common sense that we would go in that route. Now, when that vote happened, does the president have that vote in his desk? Yes, and so do I. But that's not what defines aid. That's one of many things that defines aid. We have the percentages of which countries are most with us and which ones are not most with us. So as we're making foreign policy decisions and we're down to the wire, do we open the book? Yes, it helps us make a better decision. And for those smaller countries that don't necessarily have a voice and don't have the development abilities and are always with us, we should want to help them. We should want to support them in the way that they support us. Do you want to make some news by telling us a concrete example of a, a country that paid a price uh, with America for that vote? No. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let me get back, though, to the substance of the issue. So you, you spoke very eloquently uh, about Israel and, um, and def defending our, our close friend uh, and ally, Israel. The, the Palestinian people have legitimate aspirations as well. So how can we uh, meet their needs for uh, dignity and for self-determination? And do you worry, I'm thinking now of the violence last Friday and the, the intelligence warnings that it could reappear tomorrow. Uh, do you worry that that situation is getting worse rather than getting better and maybe heading to some a uh, horrible conflagration? What I hope is for a better life for the Palestinian people. They deserve it. Everyone should have a good quality of life. The problem is President Abbas doesn't need to stay in, in the way of that. We have a peace plan. The Palestinians will only win with that peace plan. It's, they're going to gain more than, they're, than they would ever lose by going with that peace plan. But instead of coming to the table and trying to negotiate, they've criticized the president. They've criticized the vice president. They called the ambassador, our US ambassador to Israel, the son of a dog. And they told me to shut up. That's really not the way to get us to want to help you. So what we've said is, let's let them calm down. We understand they were disappointed by the move of the embassy. We respect that disappointment, and we told them that. But until President Abbas and his team decide to, in good faith, come to the table, we've held the peace plan until he's ready to hear it, until he's ready to be open about it. The region knows that they're trying to get him to come to the table we are ready whenever he does come to the table, and we're committed to that. In reference to what's happened on the, on the border, especially within Gaza, it's interesting. Everybody wants to talk about Israelis and Palestinians. Nobody's talking about Hamas. Nobody's talking about the terrorist group that's throwing those kids out there. No one's talking about the terrorist group who has done so many terrible things to the Palestinian people. That's who we need to be talking about. Israel's going to defend itself. But the idea that Hamas wants to do this protest and use women and children to do it says so much more of why we have to urgently move with the peace plan because we have to give them real leadership. We've got to give them real quality of life. We don't need them following Hamas. So we're gonna to continue to be committed to the process. As, as you were speaking both about um, American ideals and, uh, and about your belief in the police, peace process, I was, I was hearing in my ear Condi Rice, who spoke similarly about a decade ago. Um, and promoting actually elections in the Palestinian Authority as a way, as a step in that peace process to create responsible governments that would be accountable to their people and not kleptocratic regimes like Yasser Arafat. And then 
Hamas won the elections. And it seemed to call into question this whole uh, idea that the democratic process is part of the solution to the peace process, uh, the need for a peace process in Israel. Where do you, you fall on that? Should we be despairing that Hamas hijacked the elections and now rules Gaza you know, elected once and never to face elections again. I think we should call Hamas out for what it is. It's a terrorist organization. And I also think we need to show that emphasis needs to be put on the regional partners because they are the ones that can push the Palestinians to say, let's get to the table. And they know that. And so what we have said is, bring them to the table. We're going to have all the regional partners know the peace plan as well, because they have to be invested in it. And so once the entire region is invested in what that new peace plan is, everything can move forward. But I don't think the region is going to want to support Hamas. The region is going to want to support the Palestinian people and the Israelis living side by side in peace. So let me take you all the way around the world to the Caribbean. You criticized the Obama administration for the Cuba deal and said that the president got no concessions up front on human rights and then there was no fruits following from the deal. And I would accept that critique. But didn't President Obama have a point when he said, we've tried 50 years of getting tough on Castro, the Castro regime, and that hasn't produced results either. So is Cuba one of those problems where nothing works, where we have to just wait for the passing of the brothers before we can uh, look for progress. Nothing may work in Cuba, but we don't need to contribute to what they're doing. When we lifted um, all of the limitations to traveling to Cuba, what's so worrisome is if you go to Cuba and you want to be a tourist and you stay in a hotel, that hotel is probably owned by the government. Most of those hotels are owned by the government. So you're literally giving your money to a dictator who suppresses his people. That was what that was about. I don't know that we can help the Cuban people like we want to help them. But what I do know is we're not going to contribute to their hurt. We're not going to contribute to their oppression. And we're not going to contribute to a dictator who doesn't have any respect for human dignity. The, the mystifying thing to me was those reports of damage done to uh, our diplomats who were in um, Havana. Can you help us understand what was going on there? Why would Cuba do that? And how could it happen if Cuba was not allowing it to happen? You know, I think that you have to look at that's another reason why we don't need to support a regime like that. You had diplomats in an embassy that started to have these terrible symptoms. Now, they have done a lot of research. They have done a lot of investigating. They have not said that it necessarily is the Cubans. But we've pulled just about everybody out of there because we're not going to take chances on doing that. I'm not going to try and say who I think it is, but I know it's just more symbolism to what the Cuban dictatorship has shown themselves to be. Okay, let me ask you about another Obama deal that you've criticized, the JCPOA, the deal with Iran. Um, and here what matters is not just people praising or criticizing an administration decision. Based on news reports, it looks like the president is poised to decertify the deal in May, and he certainly has expressed frustration with the deal. If he does that, our European allies are not going to follow us out of the deal. We'll leave alone. They'll stay in the deal. And Iran will still be able to do business with the Europeans. Uh, and the Iranians will now have an excuse for uh, um, blaming the United States if they decide to break the deal. It seems to me precisely because your, the, the deal might have been a bad deal, it front-loaded all the benefits to Iran. We're stuck now. And if we leave, we're the suckers, and Iran is not the sucker. That's a critique you often hear. What's the answer to that? So let's look at the facts. Iran was being a destabilizing country. 
that was causing threats, and the international community decided that we needed to come together to find a solution. They give them a hundred billion dollars and say, behave. They tell them that where they did have nuclear activity and research, on their military bases and in their universities, that they have the right to inspect them. But they'll give them 28 days notice. They do all of this and think that if they treat Iran as a good international neighbor, then they'll act like a good international neighbor. So we don't know, all things said, the Iran deal, it seems to be they're following it, but they've yet to check a military installation. They've yet to check a university. They've yet to check those places where we knew the activity was going to happen. But let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they're following the deal to where they're supposed to. Since taking the $100 billion, and the Europeans would agree to this, they have violated a Security Council resolution that bans them from doing any ballistic missile launches. They violated it. Support of terrorism. They continue to grow it. We see it everywhere, whether it's in Lebanon, whether it's in Syria, whether they're in Yemen, if you see what they're doing, what's happening in Gaza, all of that. They're only increasing their presence and moving into more territories. And they're not supposed to be selling arms or selling any sort of equipment to other neighbors. And they're, we know they're arming the Houthis in Yemen. So you tell me, do we stay in a deal where they've taken our money and continue to violate, and the Secretary General and the, in the United Nations has a report that has listed all of these violations? We can be like the Europeans and close our eyes and say we're not going to look. Knowing that there's a sunset that ends in 10 to 15 years, and we're already three years into it. Are you comfortable with that? Or do we look at another option? The other option is work with the Europeans. Can we fix these things? Can we stop them from doing ballistic missile launches? Can we get them to stop supporting terrorism? Can we get them to quit giving the Houthis uh, and selling arms to them? If, and can we change that sunset clause that says in seven years they'll be right back at it? If the Europeans don't find a way to help us do this, and we are making an honest effort every day to try and get these things changed, let's say we do get out of it. What changes? We stay true to our values that we're not going to support an actor that's supporting terrorism. The Europeans stay in the deal. Fine, they can have at it. We can put our sanctions back on. Iran is not going to get out of that deal. They want the trade with the Europeans. They want to keep the $100 billion that they have. They're not going to leave, but we don't have to be a part of it. And we don't have to partake in the fact that they continue to do all of these things. What we're going to do is protect ourselves, and we're not going to turn a blind eye to Iran. So earlier this uh, semester, we had Brian Hook, who is the director of policy planning at the State Department, and as you know, has the lead for negotiating with the Europeans to try to toughen pressure on Iran for all the non-nuclear activities. And, but for that effort to work, it seems to me we have to credibly promise We'll stay in the nuclear deal if you ratchet up pressure on Iran for the missiles and human rights and terrorism. Uh, but if the president decertifies, then what incentive do the Europeans have to join us in ratcheting up pressure on these other activities, which they recognize is nefarious, but just not covered by the deal? We have done that for months. For months, we've worked with the Europeans saying, we need you to do this. We, they know the middle of May date. This is not a surprise to them. This was told to them plenty of times. Several months ago, they knew that they had that. Now, the one thing I'll tell you is don't ever call the president's bluff. 
Because just because you tell us, okay, we'll work with you, if it's not actions, if we can't see results, it's not real. We're not going to let them just play us along and say, oh, we'll do it, we'll do it. I'm at the UN. I've tried to get them to do a resolution against Iran for the ballistic missile attacks. They're not doing anything. So who's not committed? We're still waiting. So let me ask you about North Korea. North Korea, one of the signature achievements of, the, of President Trump and the administration is the toughening of sanction pressure on North Korea. You maybe had a little bit to do with that. So uh, do you think that pressure on North Korea is sufficient? Are, is North Korea squeezed enough where they will make a deal? And if not, and the president has his summit and they're not willing to make a deal, then what? So North Korea, um, you know, the idea of trying to work a deal with North Korea is not new to us. We have danced this dance eight times before. They've said they wanted to talk. They've said they would stop. They asked for money. Money was given, and they went right back at it. So what can we do different? And that's what we tried to do, was not repeat the same mistakes that we've made in the past. The first thing we knew is that any revenue that North Korea gets, they don't use it to feed their people. They use it to feed their nuclear program. So we knew if we reduced the revenues they were getting, we were reducing their ability to grow the nuclear program. We passed three sanctions packages that literally cut off all of their exports, stop 90% of their trade, 30% of their oil, and stopped their labor program where they made most of their money. On top of that, we just this past week did another set of sanctions on ships related to coal and oil. They're suffocating right now. So as much as they wanted to be strong-armed and do tests and all of these things, it's now a reality check. They realize it's not getting better. The international community joined us in isolating them. And I think they need an out. So what you saw is they got with the South Koreans at the Olympics. They held hands. Um, they've since met with China. And they'll, they'll do a couple more meetings. And that's fine. They should get along with their friends in the region. But we're not lifting any sanctions. We're not reducing any pressure, and we've told the rest of the international community, don't praise something that hasn't happened yet. So when the president ends up speaking with Kim, the conversation has to be about denuclearizing. Not just some of it, all of it. We don't want an irresponsible actor to have any sort of nuclear weapons. He either does it or he doesn't. If he doesn't, we'll deal with that. If he does, then, you know, maybe we can work on something. But we're going into this very cautiously, um, very much knowing that he's looked at the Iran deal, he's seen what he can get, and he's seen how he can push through loopholes, and we're not going to let that happen again. Let me take you back to the Middle East and Syria. Uh, another one of President Trump's accomplishments was enforcing the red line uh, on Syrian WMD use, chemical weapons use at least the first time. About a year ago uh, uh, was when that happened. This was correcting a mistake that you and President Trump have said was made by President Obama. He did not enforce the red line. President Trump did. I worry that President Trump might be on the verge of making another mistake that President Obama made, which was to leave Syria too soon, to end the fight against ISIS too soon. As you know, President Obama took troops out of Iraq and lifted the pressure on AQI, and that led to son of AQI, ISIS. President Obama had to go back in. We've now made significant progress, but we're not finished yet, and the military advisors say there's still more to fight, but President Trump is talking about pulling the troops out. Is that are we going to spike the ball on the five-yard line and, and recreate the mistake that President Obama made? 
I mean, our goal is not to create, is, is to not redo any mistakes that any previous administration made. So we always try and learn from what's been done in the past and tried to play it a little differently. What I can say is the number one priority in Syria has always been to defeat ISIS. And they've made huge grounds on that. I think we've probably um, eliminated 80% of it, destroyed the caliphate, and are continuing to move in a good direction. What the president is saying is that was always our priority, was to defeat ISIS. When we defeat ISIS, he's not saying he's going to get out. He's saying we're going to work with our partners and our friends and decide what next. So it only makes sense that you go back and you say, okay, if that was our priority and we accomplished it, is there anything that we can do to contribute? Is there anything we can do to help? But we're not going to allow ISIS to come back. That's the, that's the main thing. And what I can tell you is the president listens to his generals completely on this because they don't want ISIS to come back. And so it, what we're doing is just talking about the priority, talking about the fact we almost won it in the fact of getting rid of ISIS in Syria and Iraq, but then saying when the time comes, there will be a decision to be made. And I think that's the right approach to be taking. I think it, I should get credit for getting this far into our conversation and not mentioning China. But I'm gonna mention China now. So we need China for North Korea, for success in North Korea. China has the most influence on North Korea. Chinese pressure on North Korea has the most success. Is now a good time to have a trade war with China? And how can we manage our trade disputes with China uh, whilst also accomplishing the other stuff? And I'm thinking of you as a governor, former governor, you probably know what these trade wars can do to industries and states. Yes, I do know what they can do, and I can tell you that um, if you look at what China has done over multiple years, and not just ask the United States, but ask their neighbors, they have um, watched out for themselves at the detriment of others, um, whether it's stealing an inter international capital, um, intellectual property, um, continuing to do trade things that benefit them and disadvantage the rest of us. Um, the president has said we're losing 500 billion annually on the trade deals that we have with China and he's saying something needs to give. The idea that he's throwing tariffs out is giving China an ultimatum. He's basically saying, if you don't wanna talk about this 500 billion and how we can work together so that it's more equitable, then I can go the tariff route or you could come to the table and we can manage this um, just between the two of them. This is total negotiations at this point. No tariffs have gone into place by the U.S. or by China. What is about to go into place is negotiations. And that's gonna depend on what China decides to do. But I will tell you, you look, we just signed a new agreement with South Korea and the president's looking at every one of those trade deals saying, are we getting something out of it? And if we're not, can we get a better deal? And I think you're seeing that play out. So let me go back to a question I asked you at the outset, which had to do with personnel shifts. So Secretary Tillerson leaving, uh, Mike Pompeo has been nominated, um, and H.R. McMaster is leaving, and um, John Bolton starts on Monday, as we understand it. That's a lot of churn in the, at, at the top levels of a national security team. From looking at it from the outside, it seemed like by December, you, the team had finally sort of figured each other out and was working together. And now they've, the president's tossed it all up, and you have to figure all that out again. Do you think allies worry about that churn? And can you, what can you say about your new partners that are going to be joining you in these meetings? Allies may be concerned, but I know from being a governor that when you have cabinet members, chemistry is just as important as philosophy and process. And so you've got to find a way to manage those. If you don't have chemistry with one of your key players, you have to make a shift. 
That's, that's just the way, he's got to make the decisions. He's got to be able to make decisions with people who he can actually work with, understand, and that they can communicate together. I think what he saw was he needed to make some changes, and he did that. I think that every one of the people who we have seen exit were good, honorable, hardworking people. And I think the people who are coming in are good, honorable, hardworking people. They know the issues, they're very qualified, and I believe that we'll work well together. I'm not concerned at all. So uh, John Bolton was famously served in the seat that you now serve in. Um, are you worried that there'll be the, what, 600 mile screwdriver from Washington telling you what to do from Washington because he's been there and he has a strong view about the UN? No, he wouldn't do that. <laughs> Look, I, I think that the, when I took this position, I knew that coming from being a governor to being able to do this position properly in a way that I could serve the country and serve the president, that there were going to have to be a few things that would allow me to do the best that I could. It needed to be a cabinet position because I wanted to have that separation so that I didn't have someone constantly pushing on me to do that. I wanted to be on the National Security Council because I'm a policy girl. That's where the decisions are made, and I wanted to be in the room when they made them. And I said to the president, I'm not going to be a wallflower or a talking head. And he said, Nikki, that's why I want you to do this. So he and has been very respectful and stayed true to that. I know John Bolton well. I've gotten advice from him. I've talked to him. I know his disdain for the UN. I share it. Um, so, no, I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think we're going to have a great working relationship. You know, I like everybody, the National Security Council, we come in and we're very committed together, and I think we'll continue to see progress. So let me change pace entirely and ask you a question. Do you think in my lifetime I will see a female president of the United States? <laughs> Yes, I absolutely do. Let me, let me see if I can't sharpen that question. Do you think in my Don't lifetime, even go there. <laughs> do you think in my lifetime I will see an Indian American female president of the United States? I'm trying to survive this job right now. <laughs> You know, what I can tell you is I have been blessed. I was blessed by parents who always reminded my brothers, my sister, and me how blessed we were to be in this country, that we could do anything we wanted to do as long as we worked hard for it. And I also know that my mom always said, whatever you do, be great at it and make sure people remember you for it. The blessing that I have on top of that is I've never been the person that said, I want to do that or I want to go there. I've kind of loved the surprises. I never thought that I'd be a legislator. I n certainly never thought I'd be a governor. And if you had told me I was going to be living in New York with all that snow, I would have told you you were crazy. <laughs> so I, I say all this to say and I say this to a lot of the students out there. If you're just good at today, if you try and make today better than yesterday, let things fall where they need to. Let God do his thing and don't worry about it. And that's what I do every day. My hope is that I make the American people proud. And if I do that, I'm not worried about anything else. Well, you have certainly done it here and please join me in thanking. Thank you.